campus and be streamed live and recorded with ePresence. I guess now it's called Desire to Learn Capture. Um, we spun out a company in 2008 called Captural Technologies to try to take this technology which had already achieved significant success um, from our lab, which we then called the Capture Lab. Um, and uh, we sold that company to a wonderful Kitchener company called Desire to Learn, which is one of the major vendors of courseware management systems. And sometimes, someday, even you two at U of T uh, will be able to use Desire to Learn once it gets rid of Blackboard and adopts the Desire to Learn, which I suspect it will do sometime this decade, five to ten years after everyone else in Canada has done it. Enough polemics. Uh, sorry about that. How many people do we have online? Okay. Um, so none of that counts. About 12. I'm just, oh, 12, 12 online. Wow, great. Okay, good. That was the idea. We're building it. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about the work of our lab. Um, the um, We're dealing with, and it's easier for me to stand here because then I can keep an eye on the slide. I can't actually see the slide on the screen very well. Um, we're here because of a problem and an opportunity, and this is like preaching to the converted at uh, this institute. Okay, the good news is we're living longer uh, than ever before, and Barbara, you, uh, you may notice I've changed the stats again. I now got the 2000, and, oh, it says 2004, sorry. It's really 2012 data, the latest projections from the UN. And the UN no longer tries to project out to uh, 2300 as they used to. Uh, they're now content to project up to 2100. But even at 2100, the world population of seniors, and I'm sorry, there's another mistake on that slide. Boy, is this embarrassing. It's over 60 is their definition. Uh, is going from 5% that it was back in 1950 to 28% in 2100. So the good news about that is that there's many more years, statistically speaking, for all of us to enjoy the rewards of a good life. Uh, um, many, but not all of us in the news today have good lives. Um, to enjoy family and friends, to convey wisdom to anyone who will listen, to reap the rewards of a good life. The bad news is that we have many challenges in order to do that, ranging from motor challenges to sensory challenges to cognitive, et cetera, including conditions such as mild cognitive impairment, uh, um, Alzheimer's disease, stroke, Parkinson's, et cetera. Um, we're also particularly interested in a condition or a challenge that isn't captured quite by those mainly physical or cognitive conditions, and that's social isolation and loneliness, and that'll be a major uh, theme of the, the talk today. So we asked the question, can technology assist seniors? There's lots of data out that says that 50, 60 percent of seniors in various parts of the world are on the internet. Um, uh, but the question is, looking a little more closely, what role could technology play? In order to think about that systematically, I have found helpful a classic paper by Abraham Maslow, I believe it was published in 1944, in which he said, it's possible to think about human needs in sort of a structured way, starting with the most basic. Uh, if you don't have oxygen, food, water, or you're freezing to death, everything else doesn't matter. You can't survive. If you have that, then you need to feel safe. If you're every moment you're worried that someone's going to break into uh, your, your door, your hut or whatever, uh, then you're in trouble. But now we move towards more positive opportunities, love, affection, being part of a community, a family, esteem, the need to feel valued, the need to feel that you're doing something valuable, and then finally what he called self-actualization. Uh, some might call that religion. I don't want to go there about trying to define it, but but at any rate, self-actualization is Maslow's highest uh, uh, level. Um, we think about, uh, so in response to the needs, we try to develop novel technology. 
Uh, I've been building novel technology for 45 years or so, and about 13 years ago, I said, hmm, I'm about to turn 60. Maybe there's something we should do uh, for me so that when I need it, it'll be ready, and also for others. It wasn't quite that egocentric. But anyway, so there are two, there, we're not the only people doing it. There are uh, an increasing number of groups in universities, research labs, companies all over the world doing this, but they tend to cluster into two groups. Uh, the largest cluster by far are uh, scientists and engineers who come out of computer science disciplines called things like artificial intelligence, computer vision, ubiquitous computing. And their goal is to make machines smarter and smarter and smaller and smaller, uh, machines that very often will watch you or listen to you in order to recognize when something bad has happened or possibly even prevent something bad from happening. That's very important work. But our approach is somewhat different. Uh, rather than having, trying to make machines smarter and smarter to watch over us, we try to build machines that can help people and their families become smarter and smarter so that they can better look out for themselves. And this is a very important philosophical uh, distinction. So, uh, and we're interested, for example, in greater inclusion. Can we enable seniors to remain active participants in life as they get older? So what we do is we envision, in other words, come up with what we think are bright ideas, uh, try to see if, well, this seems to meet some need, design something, build it, test it, and if we think we are onto something, we then start companies to commercialize it. And we just uh, started our second company, and I'll tell you just a wee little bit about that. Uh, the four kinds of solutions that we look for uh, in general, are the people in our field, including both philosophies, look for. And the easiest way to uh, understand that is to consider the example. Let's say you have a child or a grandchild, uh, or I mean, there are a lot of young people here, or you are a person uh, who texts while skiing and you have an accident and you may have broken your leg. Okay, not that anyone here would do that, but um, uh, and so. Uh, you know, some whatever ski patrol will come and take you on a stretcher and they'll take you off to a clinic or a hospital and they'll x-ray your leg. So that's a diagnostic instrument, okay? If they decide that your leg is broken, they will give you a cast and give you a crutch and say, be very careful, don't ski, I try to take care of it and it'll get stronger. That's a prosthetic. Um, if then your leg seems to get stronger, it looks like it's healed by another diagnostic test, another x-ray, they may take your cast off and say, okay, now start exercising systematically doing rehabilitation with a physiotherapist. And it's possible that when you discuss your experience um, with your parent or grandparent or a good friend who's wiser than you, they might say, well, you know, the next time you go skiing, maybe you shouldn't text. Uh, and so that would, be a re that would be a preventative intervention. And so in thinking about the technologies, uh, it's helpful sometimes to think about where do they fit on this classification scheme. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through the Maslow hierarchy from bottom to top, except here we're showing it uh, physiological at the top, and we're going to briefly look at some technologies in, each, uh, in response to each category of needs. And most of what we're going to talk about are things that you can actually get now in the marketplace. But in a few cases, we're going to talk about things that are in the research lab, including in uh, a few cases, things that are in our lab. So let's start with physiological needs, focusing particularly on health. Uh, one, of the major, um, one of the major advances, I think, in uh, the impact of the internet on health is the fact that uh, we can now go on the internet and we can learn far more information about our health condition than we could practically when we would have to go to the library and figure out, you know, what medical school textbook or what information we could access to tell us something. And so here you see a randomly selected uh, topic, prostate uh, gland enlargement, and you see screenshots from a U.S. government website, PubMed, from a respected uh, clinic website, the Mayo Clinic, and from a commercial website, 
WebMD. There's another kind of source of information. Uh, the first source of information that I just described was I'm a health consumer, I'm a, med I'm a consumer of medical services, I want to understand more what's going to happen to me or what could happen to me, and I want to get the information from experts. The other kind of thing that's happening now is people are using social media and going out on the internet and saying, well, you know, I think I might have a brain tumor. I wonder what experiences other people who have had brain tumors or have worried about them or have recovered from them or whatever, what they will be willing to share with me. And here's one example, and there's a lot of this going around. One of the challenges, of course, uh, that uh, we and the medical profession have is how does the better understanding of health consumers, I mean medicine consumers, uh, reflect back in a, a more enhanced dialogue with uh, our doctors, et cetera, and, uh, or is it an enhanced dialogue? You know, is the information we're picking up correct? And what does this make, uh, what do the physicians do about this? The other area where there's a lot of activity in the health side is fitness. Um, everybody knows that the fitter you keep, the more exercise you have as you get older, uh, the better off you are in many ways. And so increasingly people are wearing little monitoring devices. This is one from Fitbit. This uh, slide was taken a couple years ago, so now they have a whole variety of sizes and shapes and colors, et cetera. Um, and you wear one of these and it keeps track of where you are and how you move, et cetera. And this can be fed back to you uh, or to your doctor or whatever and can be used by you to understand whether you're getting enough activity. Uh, alternatively, this same kind of thing can be built into game-like environments. So here you see uh, examples of uh, the um, uh, Nintendo Wii, which was a technology that you could use that would monitor for example, how you're doing a tennis swing or how you're, um, how you're rolling a, a pretend bowling ball. And so if you can't actually get to a bowling alley, you can play bowling in this pretend way with uh, a computer watching you and noticing how your arm moves and saying, okay, had you done this with a bowling ball of such and such shape and weight on a alley uh, uh, that's um, such and such size, if you had been so and so close to the alley, and if you had moved uh, in the way you moved, you would have a gutter ball or you would have a strike. Okay, and uh, this is proving to be of interest to uh, some seniors. Um, the next area I want to talk about is safety, um, and I just have a couple of examples here. On the upper left is, and you can't see very much there. Uh, my colleague Shwetak Patel, a brilliant, brilliant engineer and inventor at the University of Washington, has built technology, and you see here uh, the prototype being commercialized by the Belkin Company. You can see something that seems to be attached to um, the, uh, the pipes leading to a water faucet, and he has versions both to monitor water flow through pipes as well as electrical flow through the circuits, and the kind of use uh, that's being made, uh, I looked at the Belkin website the other day, and they're now uh, positioning this primarily, at least in the case of fluid flow, well, either fluid or electrical for conservation for energy purposes. But it also can be used for health or safety purposes in that if there were a computer looking at this data that knew that uh, every morning in the home, in the kitchen of a senior or a senior couple, uh, there is circuit flow around 9 o'clock in the morning on two particular circuits, which just happen to be the places where you plug in the coffee pot and the toaster, and there's a day or two that goes by where there isn't any circuit flow, then either they've forgotten to tell someone that they're going off on holiday, or there may be some serious problem, and so this is a safety uh, instrument. Um, uh, another area that's been commercialized for uh, a decade or maybe two decades is the kind of fall detection device that goes, the ad is I've fallen and I can't get up, uh, where 
you're carrying something or you have something on your waist, and if you fall and you have trouble, you press a button and someone uh, at some call center says, uh, Mrs. Jones, are you okay? Uh, no, I'm not okay. Should I send an ambulance? No, I'll be up in a minute, et cetera. Uh, Alex Michalaitis, uh in Occupational Health and Sciences here in a TRA, who's one of the best in the world of the kind that builds smart technologies, is working on computer vision technology that sits in the ceiling and looks for silhouettes on the floor that look like someone who fell. And one of the questions is whether people's privacy concerns about that uh, are going to mean that such technology, in fact, cannot be successfully commercialized. Another area that I don't have time to really discuss at length that I think is very exciting is uh, crowdsourcing for safety. So crowdsourcing is when you take a job uh, that involves, that can be broken up into lots of little pieces and you post it on the internet with uh, Mechanical Turk or TaskRabbit and you say, I want a thousand people to do this and I'm going to give each of them five cents if they do this in the next day. And it'll take you 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Um, Jeff Bingham and others have developed crowdsourcing applications for safety and it goes something like this, I'm blind and I can't see what I'm looking at in a supermarket, in a drugstore, or trying to go to a bus stop. And I take a picture of it with my camera, and I post that on the internet. And I ask people, "What am I? What is there? Am I about to trip over something? Does the bottle say poison? I mean, hopefully you're not going to have a bottle with poison on it in the drugstore. But uh, uh, so this is uh, answering questions with so-called conversational. Uh, crowd assistance. The third area is goes again. So I'm going up the Maslow hierarchy. I've gone. I've talked about physiological needs, safety needs. Now I'm going to talk about love or family or community needs. Uh, my interest in this was motivated by uh, the story of my sister who passed away about five years ago after a 15-year battle with MF, MS, and over between. When she was diagnosed at the age of 48 or 49, when she had a huge social community, including people at work, uh, at her religious institution, uh, in her musical group, uh, and at home with kids uh, in their teen years or almost in their teen years who had lots of friends dropping by, uh, in her last two years, there was almost nobody in her life other than the nursing staff, her husband who came once a week, her kids who came every few weeks and one or two friends who came every three months or six months because she, for her health uh, purposes, allegedly, she was moved from her home to a so-called rehab facility almost two hours away and she was, she was really all alone. So I started to imagine uh, her TV uh, being interrupted with a voice coming out, because everyone in this place was watching TV, or at least the TVs were running. Every, almost everybody was in, the, in, in, in a bed. And I inter imagine the TV interrupted with, we interrupt this mindless dribble with a message from your son. <laughs> Hi, Mom, it's Neil, thinking of you. Went golfing yesterday, shot three birdies. Love you. Um, I, I don't think my sister Janet cared how many birdies Neil shot on a particular day. But at that stage of life, this would have been huge, the ability to have some connection every day with the outside world. And so we've started to work on this problem over the last five years. Uh, first of all, we realized that it didn't just apply to people with MS. It ap applied to seniors living alone, not all seniors living alone, but some seniors living alone, some seniors living in care institutions, <laughs> not all, but some perhaps not uh, missing having friends or acquaintances nearby, but missing their family who were off in some distant place, people in long-term hospitalization. Uh, it applied to lots of people stuck at home with chronic pain, which is a far greater problem than I had realized, um, as well as 724 homebound caregivers, an area that uh, Professor Elsa Marziali, recently retired from uh, social work in Baycrest, has looked uh, particularly at. And so uh, it applies to people who, whose social networks uh, have shrunk significantly from what they were uh, to 
what they are now, or in some cases, people who have always had small social networks. Um, there's lots of technology for connecting people available, ranging from things like Skype. Uh, how many of you actually Skype uh, every week or almost every week with a parent, a friend, a grandchild, or something like that? Any of you? OK, so uh, certainly the computer savvy um, families with people with savviness on both ends use Skype. Uh, there's lots of messaging clients, email clients out there. Uh, but we have felt, based on the work we did, that there was a need for a new solution. And uh, Barbara, at the end of this, will talk about the field work we did, which convinced us that we needed a new solution, show you a video illustrating the new solution, and talk about the beginnings of the results of the significant testing we're, we're, we're doing. Um, OK. And now I want to continue um, uh, through uh, the fourth level of STEAM needs. And I could do a whole talk on this, but I'm just going to give you three examples. The first, uh, and these deal with uh, things that you do that uh, are important for your feeling of efficacy that you can still cope with the world, even if you've had a stroke or you have dementia or whatever. And these are, number one, speaking, number two, reading, and number three, generally remaining cognitively fit. So I want to talk briefly about each one. In the area of speaking, uh, we did a lot of work on this about six, five, four years ago. And we came up with something called My Voice. And the idea of My Voice is a mobile app that uh, knows where you are and can provide vocabulary for you, not only general vocabulary that would be useful anywhere, but for example, if you're in a Tim Hortons, it might highlight words like coffee, cream, donut, Timbit, et cetera. And if you're in a movie theater, it might highlight words like ticket, popcorn, seat, washroom, et cetera. And so what Talk Rocket Go uh, which is the name, the commercial name of the software does, is it brings up vocabulary on your screen. You see examples here, hello, good morning, good night, goodbye, both in text and image form, and uh, as reminders to people whose speech problem is partly cognitive, as is the case sometimes after aphasia. But if your speech problem is partly the ability to articulate it, to voice the sounds, it will also use uh, as state-of-the-art voice synthesizers to speak the words for you. State-of-the-art voice synthesizers aren't that good, but they're good enough to be understood. And they're better than they were 10 or 20 years ago. They're still not all that great. Um, we're also working on technology for reading. And here you show, here you see a couple slides from an early prototype of what we call the ALT ebook reader. ALT stands for Accessible Large Print Listening and Talking. And as you see there in the slide, um, uh, there uh, at the bottom is a keyboard that's been set up to make it easier for you to use a limited number command set, even if your hand shakes. You can see on the screen it's shown in large print. and it's talking because you can actually have it also read the text aloud. And what you see on the right is a large screen display. And that was one of our initial uh, tries at thinking about uh, the issue of how do you read together. And one of the things we're very interested in is not individuals reading by themselves, but individuals reading together. The original motivation, the undergraduate who built the first, pr first prototype of this, Z Xavier Snellgrove, was very motivated by the fact that his grandmother used to read vociferously, no, vigorously, often, lots. <laughs> his grandmother read a lot, and as she went blind, it was harder and harder for her to read. And so he would go to read to her. So one of the things we could do is um, the alt ebook would listen to you, so Xavier could read to his grandmother out loud, and then it would record it, and she could 
uh, then reread it or have the material read to her, and where Xavier had read portions, she would hear it in his voice, and where he had not, uh, she would hear it in a synthesized voice. And ideally, sometime in the next five or ten years, this is a very hard problem, we'll be able to listen to Xavier reading and have anything read back in Xavier's voice, but that's, that's still very difficult. The third area I want to talk about that's in the esteem category is the area of brain fitness gains. And uh, there's a huge commercial hype now. Uh, Lumosity is the company that has the most ads on TV. Uh, they seem to be very well funded and or very successful. Uh, and, uh, and basically, the pitch is that if you train your brain by doing uh, appropriately designed exercises in the same way that if you train your body, uh, uh, you can uh, do thing, more things physically longer because your body is a more finely tuned instrument. The idea is to make your brain a more finely tuned instrument uh, so that you can hopefully slow down cognitive aging and even delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, uh, and this is now a commercial frenzy. It's probably going to be four or five billion dollar industry uh, next year. Uh, and uh, part of this is based on a concept called cognitive reserve. Uh, if you Google cognitive reserve, the person whose name will come up with most often is Jakob Stern, who I, vis I visited his lab at Columbia Medical School on sabbatical a while back. And what Yaakov and others have shown is that over a lifetime, if you uh, go to Harvard or Yale or U of T as opposed to getting a high school education, if you're a lawyer or a doctor or a research scientist as opposed to being a ditch digger, if you're physically fit as opposed to being a couch potato, if you eat the Mediterranean diet as opposed to eating at McDonald's or pizza every night, if you have lots of friends as opposed to being a hermit, if you had a bilingual education early in life as opposed to unilingual, you have built up more cognitive reserve and you're better able to withstand uh, plaques and tangles and not, and the phrase they use is express Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but there's relatively little evidence, not no evidence, but relatively little evidence that if you start to do crossword puzzles every day at age 60 or start to do lumosity exercises, that you will uh, uh, decrease your cognitive aging or uh, delay the onset of Alzheimer's. There's a lot of evidence that says if you do crossword, if you as I try to do the New York Times Sunday crossword puzzle every week, that if you also then started to do uh, the Daily Times crossword puzzle, you would be better at that than if you weren't crossword puzzles, didn't you? But there's relatively low transfer of training. Uh, the last area I want to talk about is the need for uh, uh, self-actualization. Uh, and I want to use one particular example, and that's an example of a project I did with Elsa Marziali. Uh, and that was a project we called Multimedia Biographies. And the idea was that as people, as dementia progressed, uh, it would be harder and harder for the people who developed dementia uh, and as well as their family members to re-experience, to remember, to relive what life was like earlier. And so we thought that if we built motion pictures, digital motion pictures that represented the story of a life, this would help uh, deal with that problem. And so I'll show you two quick examples, just excerpts. This lady was brought here from South Africa late in life after her second husband died. So watching this, and we have video evidence of this, helps her remember names, places, faces, but also helps her remember feelings of her life. This is a more powerful example. Uh, this lady is watching the story of her life with her daughter who also is the narrator. This is you in one of Brown's kids. Really stunning. What an excellent picture. 
So in the first part clip, uh, clip in there, when she starts laughing after being compared to Katherine Hepburn, she literally can't control herself. She, she laughed for 15 or 20 seconds until her daughter says, don't choke, mom. The second example is indicative of what scientists are finding more and more, that music is preserved uh, despite the uh, development of Alzheimer's disease and people remember music uh, in a way that's very, very powerful. Uh, so we published quite a bit about uh, that study. Uh, participants really enjoyed viewing the story of their lives, even though occasionally there were moments of sadness when they saw a picture of someone who had passed away. It enhanced the reminiscence. It stimulated family conversation. Uh, and interestingly enough, in the two cases where we were, a, where uh, of the 12 people we studied, two cases they were in a long-term care facility, uh, some of their caregivers watched it, and then that enabled them to know something really deep about the people they were caring for, and not just, oh, uh, this person is 87 and is in this room and has mid-stage Alzheimer's. Um, so uh, what I want to do now is pass it over to Barbara, who's going to go back to our project dealing with social isolation and loneliness and talk more about our, our, our work there. All right, thank you, Ron. Oh, hi. Am I in front of the, no, the projector, am I okay here? Do you want me to sit down? It's up to you, okay. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about one of our main projects. It's called InTouch, and InTouch is an accessible communication technology developed for seniors. But before moving into InTouch, I wanna give you a little bit of context. So what we were trying to address here is a very specific, specific human need, which is the need for social connectedness. So for staying, connecting with family and friends while we age. And so at the same time, one of the problems that we were trying to address is the problem of social isolation and loneliness. And so social isolation and loneliness is becoming an emergent issue for a lot of Canadian older adults. And the literature shows that 10 to 40% of North American community dwelling older adults um, are socially isolated. And a recent cohort study in the US shows that 43% of 1,604 older adults report feeling lonely. Now, uh, these concepts are related, but they mean different things. So social isolation relates to a lack of quantity and or quality of social ties, feelings of loneliness, a lack of social support, and also a lack of participation in social activities. Whereas loneliness is a subjective feeling of missing people, of lacking companionship, of isolation, of not belonging. Okay, so the consequences of social isolation and loneliness are evident, uh, and they are really well documented in the scientific literature. For instance, we can look at the health effects. The negative health, health effects of social isolation and loneliness on on older adults are extremely, extremely relevant. So social isolation and loneliness are both predictors of depression, stress, morbidity, functional and cognitive decline and death. So these health risks are comparable to the, comparable to the known risks of smoking and obesity, okay? Of course, the, the costs and the, the effects of social isolation and loneliness go well beyond the health issues, so there's a lot of social costs as well. Seniors that are socially isolated are disconnected from their families, so they are less likely to be civically engaged, and they are less likely 
to participate in <coughs> social activities and they are less likely to volunteer. So they miss out on the positive effects of public participation and we communities, we lose out on their important contributions to us. Um, and so um, social isolation and loneliness represent a health and social economic burden for older adults, families, and new society, okay? So it was in this context that our lab started to develop technology to help address this problem. So we started with a lot of field studies and some early prototypes of the technology that we're gonna show you today. So we conducted several field studies with um, seniors uh, in chronic pain, 27 seniors in, in, with chronic pain. So we interviewed them to see how they were using media and what were their communication patterns and preferences. We did the same with patients in complex continuing care and also we interviewed 16 people living in different settings and we were trying to see what were the communication patterns and their preferences. We also deployed some of the early prototypes of the, of the technology that I'm going to show you today uh, in small studies. So from all these studies that we conducted before, um, we derive a set of key design implications. These are just the main, the main ones. And these key design implications guided our work during the design of the technology that we're going to show you today. So first of all, it is design appliances, so tools, not computers, not software, because people associate computers and software with complexity. And the majority of seniors uh, don't, don't have high levels of visual literacy, so computers for them are, I wouldn't say scary, because I don't think seniors are technophobic, but they do report some levels of computer anxiety. It's something that is never used before, and so they have certain anxiety about it. The second one is lavish pictures of family. We saw that having family pictures, the family album was extremely important for a lot of the seniors that we studied, particularly those that were living in long-term care facilities and institutions. Then a focus on asynchronous messaging. So like Juan said, there's a lot of Skype, other possibilities for real-time conversation. Uh, this, the, for the participants that, for the seniors that we worked with, especially uh, those that suffer from chronic pain, it was really hard for them to set a meeting, a get together, an appointment, because they never knew when they would be in pain. So it was really hard for them to kind of set a moment for communication. So they would prefer a synchronous <coughs> communication because it gave them a control, a sense of control of when to communicate according to their own needs. And the other one is support um, multimedia messaging do not that does not require typing. And this is because a lot of the people that we studied uh, suffer from some kind of motor impairment, so they couldn't type. They had hand tremors, so it, it was really hard for them to type. Uh, so we decided to use, I'm going to show you, um, an accessible technology that only requires tapping or swiping. Okay? And finally, use iconic communication, not verbal. Visual cues are very important, so our technology is mainly based on icons, so it's a non-language specific interface and we also wanted it to be as cross-cultural as possible. So I'm going to show you now the current technology. I live on my own. My husband passed away about seven years ago. I have three children, but one's in England and one's in California, and I don't see them very much. And I've hardly ever seen my grandchildren. Even I've got two great-grandchildren. I've seen, seen them once. And my daughter lives an hour away, but she's really busy. She has work and she has teenage kids, and we know what that's like. You know, I don't want to be a burden to anyone, but I do get lonely. And when you're too lonely, it affects your physical health and your mental health. My mom doesn't have a cell phone, and it's hard to do, you know, the, the regular kind of communication that you're used to. I've tried teaching my mother text messaging and email. It's Never. So good. But now, I think there's <coughs> something that's going to make a difference. Because I got to finish it. There's a lot of people who are getting older, people like my mom, who are not comfortable with that. This is a big problem because everybody else is on this information superhighway. And there's a lot of people who are on the side. And they can't get on. What is that? Computers. Not for me. I don't, I don't want it. No, no, no. I get just one more flutter. Uh, I can't do that. Just, just take it and, and try it. Try it. Please. 
she was not going to die. And I'm too old to do this. She's afraid of technology. So I did the email, and then I did the Twitter, and the tweeting, and the thing. It just scares me, these things. I don't get them when I'm scared. I, I think I won't remember anything. I'll break it. It is really simple. It's one screen with four big buttons. You can wave and say hello. You can send a picture, a voicemail, or a video. And all she has to do is hit one button, and done. If you want to just say hello, just push this. Done. Hello. Just hello to you. Yeah. Somewhere else. Yes. On my phone. That's it. One of the things you just wave. You can push a button and wave at somebody. That wasn't too bad. it over, you know, I just said, I can't do this, this isn't for me. <laughs> and then, you know, I decided I would do it. So one day I opened it up, and I put some pictures of my family, and I said, well, I'll try that wave thing. It's actually pretty simple. You don't have to have all those keyboards and things that the other computers have. And then they wrote back to me. I could see messages from them. Well, that was pretty good. It went really well. She used it. She liked it. My mother is happy. She's communicating with my faraway brothers and the kids. Those grandchildren are so cute. You know, I really can see what they're doing. I, they were growing so fast, I didn't even know what they looked like. But now I can see them at two and two and a half. I really get a sense that my family's all around me now. Let's try the camera. That's easy. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try the microphone. Hi, sweetie, thanks for that message you sent. And give my love to your children. They're such sweet little things. You might be here for me now because I know she's not all by herself and lonely at home. Hi, Aunt Esther. I love you. I hope you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Aunt Esther. Mom, you know, I never thought I could use this thing he sent me, but it's wonderful. I never thought I could do technology. And look at me. Here I am, above me, I'm doing technology. Hey, Mom. I'm so glad that you're enjoying this. I knew you could do it. I'll see you later. Love you. Bye. You know, the other nice thing about this thing, it actually reminds you about things. Today it said it's your great-granddaughter's second birthday. Oh, and there's one more thing. It tells me about my medicines. So I don't have to write everything down on pieces of paper, because I lose the pieces of paper. And then even exercise, there's a little gadget and it'll remind me because I'm not walking around enough. The device communicates with the activity monitor that she wears. And if suddenly she starts to become less active, we get notified. I worry less about my mother now because I can see her activity. Well, you're doing so great with this. Remember I said I couldn't do it and now look at me. It really changed my life, you know that. I'm much less lonely. I used to sit at home and just drink my coffee and do the crossword puzzle. It would be a very long day. And now I find I'm busy all the time. She is a different person. It's really amazing. She's really liberated. So look at her there. Isn't that oh, I'm so glad you showed me how to use this. I'm really proud of myself for learning this. You know, I'm going to recommend this to my friends. Lots of families are moving away these days. We're all kind of in the same boat. With the growing elderly population, this kind of technology is really valuable. It's been a life. All right, so this is in touch. It's I said the current technology, but that, but actually this one is still based on Android devices. 
Now we have a new version for iOS that runs on iPads and iPhones. Uh, some of the features that you saw here, the last ones, the birthday, the field reminders, and the Fitbit are not implemented in the current um, technology yet, so they are for ideas for future versions. Um, and so we wanted to test uh, this, this technology um, with seniors living in institutions, and so we conducted during this year two pilot studies. Uh, one in a in retirement community in Toronto, Ontario, and the second pilot study was done with five frail older souls, people over 80 years of age, living in a long-term care facility. Uh, now, I need to explain something interesting here, is that, as you saw, the device is based on icons, right? So we wanted to know if this I the icons were universal, and if we could see the usefulness of, of this icons and this device across cultures. So we decided to, the second pilot study was conducted with Chinese Canadians that do not speak English. Okay, that's fine. As you can see, as you can guess, the icons were not as universal as we thought they were, but I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and so, um, so, so just to give you a sense of the study design, it's a two-month deployment study. Uh, it has three stages, three phases. In the first phase, which is the pre-deployment phase, we have an individual training session with the participant. We, we teach them how to use the device. We also administer some scales, um, loneliness, depression, do support scale. And one month after that initial training session, of course, after the training session, we give the tablet to the participant to use as they, they can use it as they see fit. Uh, one month after that initial training session, we go back and we conduct um, the redeployment study, which is a usability and accessibility test. We give them a set of tasks to perform, and we are video recording how they use the device. We administer the same skills. And then two months after that initial training session, post-deployment, we go back. Uh, we conduct a qualitative semi-structured interview. We administer the same scales, and, uh, um, and so, so we can see changes across time. Now, we also visit them once a week, so we, we gather a lot of field observations from those visits. Um, <coughs> Uh, we just finished the data collection, uh, so we're going to start data analysis soon, but I, I have a few preliminary results to share with you, and I'll just go quickly through them. So the majority of, of, of users, and this is, of, co of course, a small sample size, um, they reported that the tool was really useful to communicate with their family members. However, they had different levels of adoption and use. Some were really passive users. They liked to receive message, but they didn't like to send out. Others were more active. They, they enjoyed both receiving and sending out. Um, they also indicated that they feel more up-to-date with their family's lives. And um, particularly, that they indicate that they feel more close to their grandchildren because they see grandchildren as the digital generation. And so you, they feel that this makes them a little bit cl closer to them. And they all reported that you improve their communication with their grandchildren. Of course, we found a lot of challenges as well, and I'm just gonna show you a few. Um, the importance of social support. It's interesting because we're trying to address social isolation, and one of the aspects of social isolation is the lack of social support, and then social support <laughs> is so important for technology adoption. So having family members deeply engaged in the process was a determinant factor for, for, the, for the adoption of three of our participants, they had no levels of digital literacy before, and they became the most kind of frequent users. And because their family members were there, they were there to teach them how to use it, they were always sending them messages and so on. Now, something that we didn't address was that, okay, we already knew that they had low levels of digital literacy. Uh, of the six participants, only one used a computer before. We were not expecting non-existent levels of digital literacy. They didn't even use a mobile phone before, and so they didn't have an overall understanding of what they could do or not with a tablet, and that was also something interesting. So we need to have more informal sessions with them to teach them not only about InTouch, but the tablet itself. And something really interesting, especially for me as a sociologist of technology, was to find different social expectations especially in terms of communication, something that we didn't think of about. Um, the grandchildren would send messages to their grandparents and they wouldn't, they wouldn't answer right away. They would take, you know, two days, three days, a week, like they were writing a letter. And so the grandchildren were very frustrated because their response was not immediate. 
So there is something that we need to address, the different levels of expectations in terms of communication, and also cultural expectations that we are not expecting, again. Uh, for instance, the wave uh, with the, the hand, the icon. So we didn't have any problem with that with the English-speaking uh, Canadians, but with the Chinese Canadians, um, four of the five thought that it meant stop, cancel. Even though we had a training session with them, we were there once a week to explain them how to use, but when we weren't there, they didn't use it because they thought it meant cancel, stop. So we had to change their icon. Something interesting, not only in terms of technology design, but also in terms of research design, were the cultural expectation in terms of the research itself. Some of the scales that we wanted to use, uh, social connectedness scale for older adults, friendship scale, didn't make sense at all for this Chinese Canadian. I mean, these scales are validated for Western populations, and so some of the items, like how many times you hug or, or, uh, or kiss, didn't make sense to them, like, uh, we don't hug our kids. So uh, there's something in interesting in terms of research as well that sometimes we don't think about, is that the scales that we use are validated for Western populations, and so they're really hard to administer uh, with different um, ethnic groups. So these are some of the preliminary results that I have for you today. I'm happy to elaborate more on the Q&A session if we have time. And now I'll just pass to Ron to wrap up. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so what we've done is we asserted that the Maslow hierarchy was a useful way to think about technologies in response to human needs and we've gone through all levels of the hierarchy, mainly talking about technologies that are in use now, but also talking about some things that have just come onto the marketplace or uh, might someday uh, come onto the marketplace. Um, we're, we're very happy doing this kind of work for many reasons, and one way to think about it is uh, we're not, uh, we're not uh, like there are some researchers in the world claiming that they're working on technologies to increase the human lifespan. We're not directly doing that, although uh, the, the literature connecting social isolation to mortality suggests that if we can keep people connected, we may in some cases increase individuals' lifespan. But mainly we're trying to ensure that people have happier, healthier, more productive lives and uh, into their 80s and 90s. And so I have here, this is not a quiz, you don't have to recognize all <laughs> eight people, uh, individuals who have been very productive and very successful and very in influential well into their 80s. And the assertion is that you don't have to be a Gorbachev or a Mandela or P uh, Casals or Picasso or just for Canadian content, uh, Christopher Plummer, uh, I want to identify the other three people, in order to um, be very productive in as you go into your 80s and 90s. And we hope and we believe that some of the kinds of things we're doing in our lab um, will lead to more and more of this. So we've had uh, amazing people working with us over uh, the lab itself was named in 2008, but we started to work about 2001 or two. We had amazing people working with us in a number of institutions, including Shirk and NICE, that have helped support the work. We're very grateful to all of them. And if there's, if your format allows time for questions, the floor is open for questions. And I will repeat the questions for the benefit of the uh, webcast. And I assume that. Uh, if we still have 12 people out there or something like that, hopefully 17. they'll ask some questions. How many? 17, but I haven't Seven. had any questions yet. 17. 17, okay. Any questions, comments? Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. Where can I get in touch? <laughs> Where can you get in touch? Um, we're, we're in the process of, well, um, you can talk to me and we might be able to find a way to give you a version to try. Uh, it's not on the marketplace yet. There has been a company called Family Net Communications Inc. It was just incorporated two months ago to try to bring this to market. But in the meantime, our research staff under Barbara's leadership is continuing to do uh, extensive, rigorous research studies to indicate whether it's effective or not and in what ways it's effective or not and how to improve it. And so 
we've, we've just finished, although we still have some data analysis to do on this very preliminary study uh, in one of the most difficult circumstances we could imagine, people 87 all of month, multi or average age 87, multiple chronic diseases, almost no computer background, uh, speaking a different language, we've now decided that our next test will be a little easier on us, also an hour and a half away by transit. So our next test starts at the end of January at Christie Gardens, which is only about 20, 25 minutes away by transit, uh, 15 minutes by bike. Um, a very cultured, upscale, progressive uh, community that starts with independent living through assisted living, through long-term care, through palliative care. So we're hoping mm -hmm. to, uh, and we're increasing the length of the trial. This time it's going to be a three-month trial rather than a two-month trial. And we're hoping to run about 20 participants there, uh, 16 to 20, starting at the end of January. We also uh, have commitments from Extended Care Lakeside that wants to start testing this mm -hmm. and Sunnybrook Veterans Hospital, which wants to, wants to start testing it, as well as a number of facilities out in the Waterloo-Kitchener area. So it's really just dependent on grant funding about how much uh, uh, systematic research we can do. But we're also open to we don't have we don't have that many tablets around, but we're also open to particularly if you if you own your own iPad or high-end iPhone, for people to test it without being part of one of our um, rigorous participant pools. Thank you. Yes, question in the back. The problem is um, how long these things will take to come onto the market. And how expensive it'll be because uh, we do it. I belong to an aging in place uh, committee that's trying to keep people at home. And one of the things you touched on was falls, and people could be lying on the floor for a week before you find them. Um, but to get a, 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 an alarm, a lot of people can't afford that. Um, so the question is, how long does it take yeah, to like get these well, how many years do you think it's to get them into the marketplace? <laughs> yeah. um, fall detection is an interesting example. Uh, the I've fallen and I can't get up technology has, mm -hmm. I believe, been in the marketplace for 10 to 20 years. I'm not really sure how long it was in the research lab before it got to the marketplace. Uh, things like Fitbit could also be used for fall detection. So. I expect that industry to change very rapidly. But let me let me take another example, uh, Shwetak Patel's uh, technology for monitoring electrical flow and, uh, and fluid flow. Uh, he started that research about six years ago or seven years ago, I believe. Uh, he got it to the point three years ago, I think, where he spun it out as a company or four years ago a couple years ago, he basically sold the company or the assets to Belkin, a large manufacturer of electronic and hydroelectric, et cetera, equipment. And I was on the website the other day. They're currently doing trials of it in, I think, hundreds of homes. It's part of what's called the smart home movement. And mm -hmm. smart homes to date have been more hype than reality, but it's starting to happen. And so I think, as a whole, it will be close to a decade between when Schwetag started that project and when you can actually buy this technology in your home from Belkin. Uh, our In Touch project started, uh, uh, I started thinking about it probably six years ago, and we've now just introduced the product. And, um, uh, you know, we don't, we we hope and expect success, but it's going to be some time before our technology is widely available. Uh, cost is, of course, an important yeah. issue. Uh, I can't share with you all the details about how we're going to both make it affordable and uh, make enough money to survive, but we're thinking about it rather creatively. And what's happened, as I've watched. Uh, digital technology from when I did my PhD work almost 50 years ago, started well 48 years ago, using a computer that took up 
um, uh, the size of this room times three, uh, and now realizing that what it could do was a tiny fraction of what of what you can do, and this is a four-year-old iPhone. This is not even a uh, state-of-the-art iPhone. Uh, so I think uh, I think cost is is starting to come in line. Uh, the more challenging issue, I think, not only for InTouch but for other technologies, is how does it integrate into people's lifestyle and how, uh, well, into people's lifestyle and to what extent and how do they adopt it and what mechanisms do we provide to facilitate adoption and use. And that, I think, is more challenging than the issue of cost. But uh, there, there will be technologies that initially will not be available to very poor people unless they have certain social assistance. It will be mainly affordable for the rich and the upper middle class and, and the middle class. Yeah. That was very, very interesting. Um, in terms of the cost thing, it seems to me I've been dealing with a similar issue, a relative, but the hard part of the uptake is the internet connection. That that's where you're going. People, people have used iPads, and people who use well, not everyone can afford an iPad. But that yeah. part is so yeah. complicated. It's yeah. getting older people to be willing, or even if you will pay for it, to have a long-term contract with an yeah. internet provider, which is going to be a yeah. Well, the so the that's where I'm yeah, happy the, to do the pressure. Yeah, that. the 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 question is about the cost of internet communications. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in Canada, we live in a, a, and someone used the phrase the other day in conversation, uh, a triopoly. Tri anyway, we're, we're in a situation where, and I'm willing to be recorded on video saying this, <laughs> where three very large corporations um, uh, control the marketplace. Uh, uh, telecommunications is far cheaper in many parts of the world. Someday, there will be a government uh, that will change that, and uh, and then telecommunications will be a lot cheaper. So, but I can't tell you when that's going to happen in Canada. In our so. pilot studies, mm -hmm. when the facility didn't have wireless access, we would get them a SIM card for the tablet, so we would pay for the. Well, there's obviously ways to do it. I'm yeah. just thinking yeah. the cost of that. This is the sort of thing that you would want big organizations like CARP to be right. pushing yeah. internet providers to have some sort yeah, of well service one, for this. One that looks forward to vigorous action from CARP <laughs> in various <laughs> act areas. Um, what was I going to say? The one thing to keep in mind for costs is, and I don't have a number, but for, for people who, who have to move into a residential care environment, my understanding costs of that uh, can range from two or three thousand a month to ten thousand a month. So people are already paying a lot of money to stay alive. <laughs> and uh, if it can be proven by us and other people that, for example, social connectivity um, uh, helps keep them alive longer, and if the government is willing to help support people staying alive longer or taxpayers are, then it, it should be affordable. With good quality of life, of course. Longer. With good quality of life. <laughs> I think intergenerational programs are expanding too, so they can help seniors. Yes. Yeah. There's a cyber seniors program where uh, high school students go yeah. to yeah. institutions and teach yeah. seniors how to use the internet. Yeah. The only problem with those kind of programs is that they still use a lot of jargon that seniors are not <laughs> familiar with, like Google, Twitter, and, and so it's hard to tell kids that, you know, I don't use so. those words. <laughs> well, there's, in fact, there's a wonderful movie called Cyber Seniors, you know, which is not going to win an Academy Award, but it's a lovely movie of a project done by an organization here, in fact, that I believe some of the sh shooting or all of it was done at Christie Gardens, we discovered. And um, it's both an example, it's both an inspirational example of uh, how much even high school kids can do in getting some seniors to overcome fear of technology and get more computer literate and start to doing something interesting.
but also when you look at some of the jargon they're using and some of the things they're teaching in some of the technologies that we would regard as not the most user friendly, <laughs> it's also, it's both inspirational and appalling. So we're actually going to start our own little small program. We can't do much, but uh, in March or April, we're going to start a program that we're currently calling the Seniors Digital Commons. We wish we could come up with a better name. Mm -hmm. I think of it yeah, as the, the Seniors Digital uh, Kindergarten, but mm -hmm. one of my colleagues has a lab at MIT that's called Lifelong Kindergarten Group. So, uh, and we're going to be uh, trying to use our insights into how to convey some aspects of living digital, how to convey that to a small number of seniors. And so we'll be, uh, that'll be done, as I say, starting in March or April with uh, somewhere between 16 to 24 seniors at each session with um, at least 50% then number of mentors ranging in age from um, 19 to 99 or something. Well, maybe not 99. We have one mm -hmm. volunteer who's 70 who's really keen to be a mentor in this. So. Maybe ask the seniors for a name. They're pretty creative. Yeah. Well, we're. <laughs> that's a very good idea. Yeah. In fact, that's we'll, we'll, that'll be. Uh, we'll have a competition. Yeah, in the yeah. Cyber Seniors movie, they were teaching seniors upload the upload how to upload something, and they would say, the seniors would say implode. And they're like, no, upload. I'm like, upload. Implode is so much better than upload, isn't it? Yeah. So they always have good suggestions for names. <laughs> Any questions from out there in, in the ether? No? no. Okay. They're a very quiet group. Well, okay. Thank you thank both you. very, very much. Thank that you. was <laughs> wonderful. And we're always looking for collaborators, research assistants, um, summer students, whatever. So, okay.